I am for a single and unified Ukraine. These are the words of the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko. Yet what exactly does that mean could have a different interpretation of which side you ask. Belarus, officially the Republic of Belarus, is a landlocked country in Eastern Europe. It is bordered by Russia to the east and northeast, Ukraine to the south, Poland to the west, and Lithuania and Latvia to the northwest. The name Belarus is closely related to the term Belarus, which unified Ukraine. These are the words of the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko. Yet what exactly does that mean could have a different interpretation of which side you ask. Belarus, officially the Republic of Belarus, is a landlocked country in Eastern Europe. It is bordered by Russia to the east and northeast, Ukraine to the south, Poland to the west, and Lithuania and Latvia to the northwest. The name Belarus is closely related to the term Belarus, which means White Rus or White Russia. Belarus has so far been Russia's staunchest ally, and there is once again talk that Belarus might in fact join the war and so add his manpower, as well as the strategic position of Belarus. Right now, Belarus only has an active personnel of 62,000 units, with 345,000 in reserve. And as I am writing this, Belarus says it has begun a full inspection of its military capabilities to ensure combat readiness a day after agreeing to deploy a joint military group with Russia. It comes amid rising speculation that the two countries may launch a renewed attack on Ukraine from the north. So let's get into the story of Belarus. Belarus is also a landlocked country with a leader that runs the country in an authoritarian manner that both does not want to fall to Western democracy as it could take his regime out that he has been holding since 1994. That is nearly 30 years in power. And two, being a complete servant or puppet state of Putin, Alexander Lukashenko seeks to try to both please but still has options intact. The war in Ukraine rages ever on between Russia and Ukraine. Although increasingly it seems that Russia has been on the back foot, the map of Russian control over Ukraine looking like this in March and having shrunk severely by October where we are now and towards the east and the south of the country. Whereas before there had been a large northern offensive as well. Today we found out that Belarus's Lukashenko has called for an immediate and emergency meeting between its military command. There is a statement that Ukraine will face a new attack from the north and that Belarus would join the fight in this upcoming week. Together we will point out where Belarus currently stands and their situation in joining. I am your host Ekner and this is Damp History. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN in times of conflict. Geo restrictions make some domains of cyberspace inaccessible. What happens is that governments activate national barriers to minimize their public's exposure to foreign influences. TikTok, Telegram, Facebook, YouTube, and even Wikipedia are banned or closed in some countries. Now, all is fair in love and war, but that makes my job all the more difficult because regardless of the nature of the conflict, I still have to get my hands on data and intel from the opposite side to keep my content as objective as possible. This is where NordVPN comes into. Using the app, I can digitally relocate to another country and bypass such national firewalls. It's an essential tool in my arsenal. What's more, no one, including ISP operators, can see what I'm up to, what data banks I'm accessing, or what papers I'm reading. So NordVPN strengthens my access to cyberspace while at the same time ensuring a private web experience. These two principles, privacy and security, are now more important than ever. Use the link in the description to get an exclusive NordVPN deal. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Russia announced partial mobilization leading to new recruits being taken from the male population and brought into the army that soon will be going to the front line. Furthermore, they also held elections in several of the regions that they had occupied since the start of the invasion in Ukraine and a great surprise to everyone. The Ukrainian military has been doing very well in terms of counter-attacks against Russian-occupied areas in Ukraine and have made great gains in, especially in the north of the country, Kharkiv, but are also now moving on Kherson in the south of the country as well. Part of this is due to the fact that they have sophisticated weapon systems, many of them given by the United States and other powers around it particularly the high mars or the m142 high mobility artillery rocket system has been especially effective at hitting russian positions with accuracy and from far behind the front lines thus giving them an advantage furthermore more training of ukrainian units by the west particularly in the united kingdom by various nations and cycling of troops has led to ukrainians having a generally higher morale and being better trained on the front than their russian adversaries this also will lead to further gains in future ukrainian offensives Given these recent defeats on the battlefield, Russia has announced partial mobilization, and they have around 300,000, now being moved into the army and receiving some very basic training. They've also been threatening with nuclear weapons in the hope that they might be able to force Ukraine to the negotiating table or the West. Now we will talk about Belarus's part in this war and where they stand, because they are indeed tricky to dissect. 
As stated earlier, he's been the president since 1994 and has ruled as a dictator, basically moving on from the Soviet period in much the same. He's been closely tied with the Russian state and with Putin especially. So in more recent years where he has been more financially dependent on Russia and with more overtures coming from Russia to form a sort of union between Belarus and Russia. Although ultimately, Lukashenko has resisted this to some degree. Belarus, of course, has a strategic position to the north of Ukraine and to the west of Russia. It is the final piece that allows Russia to bridge over to its other piece of land, Kaliningrad, making it a key buffer state as Russia sees it between itself and other NATO countries, and indeed a strategic position to the north of Ukraine. It was already speculated, as I mentioned, that Belarusian troops might join Russian soldiers in the offensives into Ukraine particularly in the north, and possibly to hold guard duties behind Russian lines, while Russian soldiers did the fighting. Although ultimately, as we found out, Belarus didn't in fact join the war, and Belarusian troops stayed on their side of the border, albeit aiding Russian soldiers. From there, missile launches and transport, etc. The inclusion of Belarus into the war would be some support for Russia. Even at this point, the B Russian army is only around 62,000 strong, and of course, they are quite untested in battle. They do have a reserve force of 344,000. But given that Belarus has not yet even committed its regular army, it probably doesn't make sense that these would also be added to the number, and we can only imagine that these aren't in the best shape either. However, on the 10th of June of this year, Lukashenko made a suggestion that Belarus might be joining the war because he said, and I quote, that he feared being chopped off by NATO and therefore it might be necessary for Belarusian troops to join in the attack on Ukraine. That is why Lukashenko continues to make claims that Lithuania and the other NATO Baltic allies are training Belarusian opposition to start a coup on his regime. Whether that is true or not, Lukashenko is willing to accuse, betray, and weigh his option when it comes to fabricating such claims to remain in power. He also created a people's militia. Now why exactly did he do that? Lukashenko's biggest fear comes from within his own country. His people are significantly against the war in Ukraine and are far less supportive than that of the Russian civilians. Lukashenko must ensure that he can play cat and mouse and fish out any word of opposition that may come through his regime. So is this a suggestion that Belarus might be gearing for an attack on Ukraine? Well, it seems like quite a small start just for such a large offensive. The Belarusian army is only 62,000 strong or thereabouts, and they have been untested in combat. They have not fought in any major conflicts at all, and we don't know what the state of corruption and the state of actual preparedness is. Just as we saw with the Russian army and are seeing now with the mobilization, it's probably the same, if not worse, in better risk given the state of corruption there. Furthermore, if the regular Russian army, which at times was deemed to be the second best army in the world, had so much difficulty invading Ukraine from the north, and in larger numbers, it doesn't really make sense that a smaller force, because of course that whole army isn't going into Ukraine, so a force of around 30,000 better Russian troops, there's no reason to suspect that they might do any better than the Russians who had attempted. And of course, the Ukrainians that are in the north of Ukraine have already defended it. Once they know the avenues of attack, they've already, a potentially much harder for the fight there. So strategically, it does not really bode well for any Belarusians to thrust themselves into northern Ukraine at this point, even if supported by Russian conscripts or the regular army. Yet this also seems unlikely. A second point to consider is that strategically northern Ukraine is now less important or actually less attainable for the Russians. If we look here at the map of the situation we saw in March, possibly the height of Russian control in Ukraine, and we take a look at how it looks now in October, you can see that the part of Ukraine that borders Belarus is no longer being controlled by the Russians. They moved instead to focus their offensive on the Donbass region. And it seems unlikely that the Russians, given the state of their military out in the minute, will be trying any more offensives in the north, except for the fact that they are flying drones from the north and striking it into the Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Then given that we're moving towards winter, it seems very unlikely we're gonna see any new offensives until the spring. Something Lukashenko also has to consider is his own population, as there have been huge opposition protests and indeed acts of violence against the regime in recent years, and particularly since the start of the Ukraine conflict. The war is incredibly unpopular in Belarus, and certainly compared with public opinion in Russia where it's generally viewed quite favorably. We saw, for example, that Russian troops using Belarusian rail networks faced sabotage by Belarusian rail workers who blew up train, and otherwise sabotaged Russian equipment and personnel as they made their way to the Ukrainian front, so much so that Lukashenko actually imposed the death penalty on railway sabotage that interfered with the Russian invasion. As a matter of fact, Belarusians are actually fighting in the Ukrainian conflict, 
but on the side of Ukraine, in the form of several Belarusian battalions of volunteers that are fighting on the Ukrainian side, it seems possibly quite likely that there will be even more recruitment into these groups, perhaps even by units of the army, depending on how mutinous they are. If Lukashenko does in fact announce that they will be moving into Ukraine as well, these are all things that he needs to consider. His satisfaction with his regime is only growing in Belarus. He has to walk a kind of tightrope between that dissatisfaction at home in appeasing Vladimir and the Russians, which are his only allies, particularly in the region. A further point is that actually the Belarusian army itself, the higher command, are also not in favor of joining the war. And so it might actually be the case that if Lukashenko does announce joining the war, he'll be deposed in a coup by his army generals who he relies on for support. This again makes it unlikely that Belarus is going to join the war at this very time. However, by fanning an invasion, Luhan and Barrow might actually be fulfilling a strategic role that aids the Russians because it's meant that Ukraine has had to keep several units back around the area of Kyiv and northern Ukraine in order to potentially counteract such an invasion were it to come. Of course, this means that there can be fewer troops in the east of the country where most of the fighting is happening at the minute and where the Ukrainians could use more men at all times. So really it forces Ukraine to keep its troops split and have some troops in reserve on that northern frontier to ensure that the better Russians won't invade and then take Kiev nonetheless, which, as I said, seems incredibly unlike. However, as Putin's situation gets worse and worse with some dissatisfaction at home, particularly against the mobilization, but particularly with Ukrainian advances on the battlefield and advances into areas that have now been annexed into Russia proper, as he sees it, it seems that he may continue to grasp at more and unlikely sources of aid, whether that is in the form of nuclear weapons, which I also think is very unlikely or in the form of trying to bring Belarus into the war to bring that extra manpower and equipment on site is unclear, but it does grow more likely as things deteriorate on the front. A final point to consider is that Belarus owes a lot of money to Russia as Russia has financially been backing it. If it gets to a point where the Russians really need those extra troops and the extra support from Belarus, it's possible that they might call in the loans at an unopportune time and then force him into action. But that all remains to be seen whether Belarus will join the Russian game or whether it will continue to sit on the fence whilst shouting loudly over it as they have done previously and as I believe they will continue to do so. This is the end of the conclusion and we will learn more about Belarus's future as time goes by and opportunities are revealed. I have been your host and if you would like to see more deep geopolitical analysis like this then please subscribe to the channel and give a like. It would greatly help out my channel so that I can do more. Geopolitics in full swing.